folks, he's back. We have the one and only coach Chad Carson with us. He is the author of a very important book. It is titled The Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor. Books like that speak to me because, again, I think it speaks to the average investor that I get on this channel. Chad, how you doing, man? I'm doing so well. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, congrats on the book. Uh, I, I was I got a preview of it. So thank you for that. It was it was a fun read. Uh, but tell me why. Why did you create it? I always I always want to talk to the writing a book's hard, man. Editing mm -hmm. a book's harder. Um, what was the what was the motivation for writing this book? Yeah, you do have a lot of have a lot of motivation to go through the torture of putting, putting yeah. a book together. <laughs> but yeah. but it is, it's wonderful having it out there. And I, I have two motivations. One was personal. My personal journey was one where I experienced some of the touching the fire of going big. Like I, my first couple of years, just like a brief version of my story is that I I was going to seminars and I was reading books and it, all I could hear of success was big. Success was fast. And so I tried to do that. My business partner and I were new. We we're just trying to model other people. And we tried, we had this goal to buy 50 properties in one year. And we saw people who were flipping houses and buying rentals. And so we said, oh, we can do that. And we, we were full-time investors. Just to give everybody context. We weren't just doing this on the side. We were flipping, we were buying rentals. But in 2007, we almost got there. We had 33 closings where we bought 33 properties. And some of those are multiple units. And so we, we got a lot of activity in 2007, which sounds great. And it was great for the most part, but there was also a lot of negative there. There was a lot of stress. There was a lot of debt. There was a lot of risk that happened. And we survived 2008, 9, and 10, thankfully. And we got to the other side. We had really good cash reserves. We had a lot of private financing, seller financing. So we did some things right, but it, it taught me that experience of going through that. It kind of it forced me to, to think about why am I doing this? And yeah. the, the, the answer was, I, I put a list of things together. Like I want to go travel. I, was, I wasn't married yet, but I was about to get married. I want to be present with my kids when I have kids. I want to go play basketball in the middle of the day for two hours. And I made this list and like, there was money there. Money definitely was on the list, but I needed time. I needed flexibility. Right. And so when I started thinking about the business model, a smaller, simpler, slower business model actually checked all the boxes and it actually had less risk and it, it just it hit so many of the, the things I was trying to accomplish. And so it, it forced me to think about then, and I didn't call it the small and mighty investor. Wait a minute, there's other people doing this. And I started studying people like John Schaub and a lot of other investors who have been doing this for years. It's quieter. It doesn't get as much attention. And so the, the second motivation for writing the book was beyond my personal just experience of that was I wanted to provide alternatives like you've done as well with your great series and the one rental at a time. I want to give a different narrative of what success means. And I don't want to just talk about it. I actually want to build a business model and say, here's a model. Here's what I've done. Here's what dozens and dozens and dozens of other people have done. Here's an example. Here's how you do it. I just, I, I don't want that part to be an excuse. I want, I want to scream it from the, the rooftops. Like, look, if, if you are not want somebody who needs to go big, or that's just not the right model for you, which is, I think, a majority of investors, then yeah. here's, here's an alternative that can give you everything you want financially. It can give you all the time you want, and it can yeah. do it a lot faster than you thought. You thought. Yeah, I think there's so much in that. And I just love the title, right? The Small and Mighty Investor. And you're right. It's not sexy, right? Social media is full of bigger is better, fast, go full time, burn the boats. And Frankly, I get it. It's clicky. Yeah. It probably goes viral. Doing the work, getting the four, not sexy. Not sexy. Uh, but I think it's the right path for certainly more than 90%, probably more than 95% of folks. I mean, most people are like me. They were not like you, right? You, again, did this full time. Most people are like me. I had a full time job very demanding. I was raising a dollar, daughter, very demanding. My market was unaffordable. I had to find somewhere else. It's just knowing it's okay to get to four is such a big deal. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that that, or see that it's actually made the book. So thank you for that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, your your work and you know, you've helped me give me words and vocabulary for some of the things I always knew were the, the right approach. And so I've really appreciated our the crossover of our work. And I, I had a set a list of seven rules of a small and mighty investor. And in the top three there, 
where just get four, <laughs> just, just get four get, deals. Just, don't, don't worry about a hundred, don't worry about 20, just yeah. get four. It's, it's such a refreshing perspective and, and it's so helpful to new investors particularly. You want to give a tease of maybe one or two more out of the seven? Yeah, I, I'll give you two. One of them is redefining success. Ooh, and it, I love that. It, it's just the, the idea is that you 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 are the one who defines success. And I actually am going to share a non-real estate story. There's a there's a, a basketball coach I used to love who uh, was uh, John Wooden, coached at UCLA and was a Hall of Fame coach. And the interesting thing, he's, he, to me, is one that just kind of defines excellence in sports. He was an amazing coach. He never told his players that winning or scoring the most points was the goal. Never. Hmm. Won the most games, won the most championships. The idea was success is you achieving your internal idea of what you've done your best, that you have set out to do this and you've accomplished this. And so let's take it back to real estate. If you set out to buy two properties or four properties and you set out to buy quality properties and provide somebody a good place to live and produce a certain amount of cash flow, $5,000 a month was your number, and you've achieved all of those, you've checked those boxes, you are as successful as the person who has a thousand units or 10,000 units. And I, I just, I wanna make that like super clear. And it's not, it's not gonna be easy because I, I, I'm susceptible to this too. I, I get competitive. I'm like, oh man, look at those people. They're buying all those properties. I can do that. Of course, you know, yeah. I'm just as good as they are. It's an ego thing. And, and so I, I just wanna give per permission as a small mighty investor to redefine success. And it, it takes a challenge. And for me, it's been stepping away from my business sometimes and saying, all right, what does a successful father look like? What does a successful community member look like? I've gotten involved in my community and tried to solve problems in my community that nobody else has time to solve, building bike paths and walking paths. And, and so redefine success, be okay with that. The second one is how you use debt. And I know this is a fun one. You and I've had a good conversation about this on my, own, on my podcast, which I appreciate you coming on, was you know, debt is a tool. Mm -hmm. but it's not a religion. Yes. That's not a religion that you don't have to be in perpetual debt. It's a wonderful tool. It's one of the best tools. I'm glad we have it. I'm glad I had it to get started with a thousand bucks in the bank. But the, the, the message I want to convey is like, use that as a tool when you first start, because you have very little money when you first start, use that as a wealth building tool to get from 50,000 bucks to a million bucks or 2 million bucks. Like it's wonderful for that, but don't be afraid if you want to. And I talk about a lot of examples in the book, to actually start paying off debt at some point. This has been my own path. And when you have enough- Mine too, mine too. Have a, you have enough properties paying off. I'll give you one simple example. We had a $100,000 debt on a property that was now worth 250, 300,000 bucks. We bought it for a lot less, but the, the loan had paid down over a 10 year period it was $1,000 per month. And we had a, we were fortunate to have 100,000 bucks sitting in the bank. We're like, well, what do we do with this? Can we buy more properties? Can we reinvest it? Sure, we can make more money doing that. But we looked at the thousand dollar per month payment on this debt, and we were in the stage where we were ready to start reducing risk, start increasing our cash flow, living off our income so I could go travel, live in Spain, and do some other stuff. If we paid off that property, it would free up twelve thousand dollars per year. It would reduce our risk, and it would simply we'd keep it, our life simple. We wouldn't have five other properties that complicate our life. That was an, an aha moment for me. Like it was not a bad move to pay off a debt. The, in that situation is usually later in your career, maybe yeah. five, 10, 15 years after you started. But it's, I just want to give people permission to say, you know what, the, the debt tool can be put in the toolbox sometimes. And that's actually a reasonable thing to do. No, I totally agree. As I think I shared on your channel, um, I think, I think most people go through two phases, right? There's the growth phase where I've been very clear cash out refi 1031 exchange. These were all things that just kept the party going. And then you get to a point where, financial freedom exists and you're really looking at retirement. It, one of the things I did, because again, I was buying before. So I started in 2001. I experienced and saw people blow up in uh, 07, 08, 09 and, and 10. I was like, I want to make sure that never happens to us. So what did that mean? That meant we identified a set of properties and we now have that set carved off by itself, protected, all those things. And they're free and clear. I'm like, hey, the world ends. You can have all this other stuff, but you're not getting, you know, that set. Uh, you know, I don't think I would have done that year one or two. As a matter of fact, I can tell you right now I wouldn't have. But year 13, 14, why not? Yeah, you'll go through phases. 
Yeah, and I think that's the thing. I, I've kind of gotten some pushback a little bit when I talk about small and mighty. They're like, yeah, but I want to go big. I want to keep growing. I'm not dead yet. I want to keep going and going. And the thing is that hearing that kind of example is like, you don't have to stop the rest no. of it. It's just take some chips off the table. Like t- yeah. you play, you're playing poker. Like you want a lot of, you want a lot of, you built a lot of equity. Yeah. Take some yeah. of those chips off the table, build a little, I call it a, an income floor. Just build that income sure. floor that's low risk that you don't have to mess with, you know, you've got that base and now you build that foundation. If you want to keep growing for the rest of your life and if you want to go do all it. sorts of other stuff, go, that's great. But now you have this fallback plan that you know you were protected for your family, for your income, for your retirement. That, that's an important step to take. No, I totally agree. Uh, something else you've done pretty cool is I think you, uh, at least it appeared on social media You in a moment's notice, you said, we're going to go live in Spain for a year. I think you've just returned from that. Um, why don't you set up why you did it? Talk about how the year went and, uh, what has changed if anything, once you came home? Yeah, everybody's got a why for why they're investing. And for me and my wife, when we first met our very first date, it was, we want to go live in another country. She, uh, she taught Spanish. Wow, first still. date. Yeah. First, first date. date conversation. Wow, that's I pretty mean, good. You know, yeah, we, we were uh, well, we were in yoga class, and I was like, my pickup, my pickup line was pretty corny. She was, I, I was the only guy with like a seventy-year-old guy with a bunch of ladies in the yoga class, and my pickup line was, "Oh, you teach Spanish? I want to learn Spanish. That would be great." <laughs> you <know? laughs> oh, you're slick, man. You're slick. Oh, man, it, it worked somehow. It worked, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, so we went on the first date, and we were talking about, you know, what you, what do you like to do? What do you want to? What kind of things? She had traveled to Guatemala. She's a Spanish teacher. She lived in Mexico. I. I studied German in college. I wanted to study abroad because I played football in college. Didn't have a lot of time to study abroad. So basically we want to go live abroad. And we've done that uh, several times in our adult life since we have kids as well. We have a 10 and 12 year old now, but we decided again this year that we just wanted to live in another country. We want our kids to improve their Spanish skills. Spain is a place we love. We love the food. We love the people, the culture, the siestas. Uh, it's also close to other places, parts of Europe. So we last July in 2022 uh, moved over there, rented a house, rented our house here in the United States. And then our kids went to local schools there. We walked into school every day. We lived in kind of an urban environment, really nice, nice. old town, uh, Albaicin, part of uh, Granada. And just an amazing experience. So many little details and people that you meet. I play pickup basketball a lot. So I had my group of basketball guys and soccer and hanging out buddies and just the kind of experience that I pinched myself as we're doing like this is amazing and real estate rental properties and the systems and the the passive nature of it at this point not once it's stabilized was what paid for it like that's it's that's the foundation I had a lot of time I worked you know a couple hours per week doing bookkeeping and things on my real estate but the rest of the time was go to Spanish classes write a book do other stuff be with my kids and so I, I think for me it was sort of the just the demonstration of the potential of what this can do uh, having yeah. rental properties. So, so paint me a vision. What does your portfolio look like today that en- enables you to live in Spain for a year? We're, we're talking small and mighty. So what are we talking unit count or however you kind of qualified? Yeah, so I'm on the bigger side of small and mighty. I'll kind of qualify that. My, I have a 50-50 business partner. We've been doing this for 21 years now. We okay. have, so we have 33 buildings and mm-hmm. some of those are houses. Like I love single family houses. I have a couple of mobile homes. Uh, we also have a 12 unit building and a couple smaller multifamily and our our particular market and one of the reasons we have a few more units than maybe we we would in another market is we're in a south carolina so clemson south carolina is a, it's a college town over half of our rentals are to students and so they go they go to the university we're within a mile and a half of the university we like to target like grad students and more affordable rental students we don't you know there's some student rentals that have uh, lagoon pools and luxury, you know, type stuff. Our, our deal is like, let's find the people who are paying their own way through school yeah. or they get these scholarships yeah. or they're international students. I love international students. And so those are our typical rentals. We have two management companies who help us manage um, our, our portfolio of those. And the average rent on those is about $750 oh, nice. per, per unit. So, you know, okay. I, so, so if you had a houses in my area are probably like $1,800 a month, something like that in South Carolina. So you got to have a few more units to get some of those numbers you want, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been, we used to manage it ourselves and we had somebody work with us over time. Part of my strategy to be able to work two hours per week was to hire property managers, build systems, um, make sure we have like bookkeeping systems and things like that. So that's, Pretty much what I do today is talk to my property managers, text them here and yeah. there. We have an issue that requires more than $500 to spend. I have to approve that, but yep. that's that's kind of my typical week. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot in that that's really important. Um, first off, you managed yourself in the beginning, but then got to a point where you're, again, this is all about being the small and mighty inv investor having options, right? Um, I think that's awesome when you make that transition, right? Because again, you gave up income, right? You took mm -hmm. six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent of what used to be cash flow, and now we're handing it to someone else because it freed up time, right? Time was the goal. Yeah, I looked at it. I read a book before our work week back in the day, and he, he used to talk about three currencies. You have at least three currencies. Money's one. It's really important. Yep. You got to pay pay for stuff with money. But time is the more limited currency. You only have twenty four hours in a day, and so mm -hmm. all so what, once you have a base of survival with money then you can start reinvesting your money, not just to get a return on your money, but to get a return on your time. Like if you can invest a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks and it frees up five hours of your week or 10 hours of your week, and if time is the most limited commodity, then balancing those and building a small and mighty business is a lot about that. It's about making business decisions, investment decisions that aren't just for maximizing money. They're maximizing your flexibility. They're maximizing your time. And it just happens, so it happens that being simpler, being slower, being you know more deliberate actually is a better way to optimize your time, in my opinion. And I've, I've seen it. I've seen it people with a lot more money than me who have a lot less flexibility, who are trapped like a chain to their business, to their job. And whereas I have a lot of flexibility. Some of the most peaceful, flexible people I know have like five, 10 properties and they paid Agreed. off and they can do whatever they want. Nobody knows about what they're doing. They're just like that stealth yeah. wealth, traveling the world, doing whatever they want with that simple little portfolio. No, I agree. I mean, one of the one of the guys I talk to weekly, his name's Dion, uh, and I think his portfolio, I I want to say it's sixteen units. It might be eighteen that he's collected over about twelve year period, and he's I mean he's got the life right. He's going to go spend three months in Thai, Thailand, or he's going to go here, he's going to go there, and he self manages right. So he hasn't even gotten to the point of having a property manager. You can set it up in a way. Uh, especially if you have single family homes and, you know, if you get bigger and bigger apartments, it comes with more and more headaches, yeah. my experience. Yeah. Uh, but if your portfolio is four single family homes or maybe four duplexes where they're kind of separate, um, you really can, you set yourself up over time to, to have it, uh, you know, to have the life that, that you dream of. Yeah. Management is the key component. Like not every property is equal. Like I have some yeah. apartments and that's why I have property managers because with a student rental, they leave on average every one, one and a half years. So they, you know, some stay two, some stay one, but that's, that's about it. Yeah. And so you got to release those. There's just, there's a window, you got to lease them in. So that's, it makes a little bit more income than I would on a single family house, but my single family houses, I still self-manage several of them. They are, they're, they're pieces of cake when you do yep. the right house in the right location and you get the right tenant. Your tenant is the key team member. That's why I always tenant about, selection. Tenant selection. Tenant selection is yep. great. And they, they are they are a team member. I look at them not just as a client, like they are, they they manage themselves in a lot of ways. You can incentivize that. You can keep the rent a little bit below the market value. You can incentivize them to cut their own grass. To do, you know, you're going to fix it. The heating and air goes out. The roof goes out. But you can give them the, give them the plumber's number. You can say, hey, if anything that happens like this, call the plumber first. This is my person. I'm okay paying the bill. Like you, you can really set up some self-management with single family houses that work very well. And if you have the right house, people stay five, 10, 15, 20 years sometimes yeah. in the same place. Yeah. It's funny. I looked at my portfolio. This has been a couple of years, but I'm sure the numbers are close. My average tenure in a home is eight, eight and a third years. Amazing. Average in apartments, uh, two, 2.1, I think 2.1 years. So again, turnover, headaches, all of that. Very, very different. If I had to do it all over again, there's a pretty good chance I would build a portfolio of mainly single family homes. Yeah, uh, there's a pretty good chance of that. So let me ask you a question. Somebody takes the time to buy the small and mighty real estate investor, which everybody should. They read the book. They put it down after finishing the last page. What do you hope they took from the book? Yeah, I, I hope that they are confident, more confident. I, I've heard so many already, the people who read the book in the first couple of weeks, the, the, the sentiment has been relief. It's like, they, it's like they felt like they were living another life. They were like, gosh, I, I was feel like I was pretending to be this like big investor. I was like dreading it. I was thinking I had to do this thing. And there's just this sense of relief that, ha, huh, finally, it's like this peaceful kind of feeling comes over. Not that you're not going to work. Not that, I, mean, I don't think anybody's, I don't think people are afraid of hard work. I don't think people are afraid of doing the work that like you talk about every single day. There's a the little things you got to do. But I think people get kind of stressed thinking, oh man, like I'm not enough. Like I'm not good enough. And a lot of the marketing ploys of like go big, you know, mm -hmm. be huge it is, is making you feel like you're not enough. And I'm, I'm, what my message is, is like, no, no, you're, you're good. You're good. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually pretty simple. 
the, the, the strategy is pretty simple. Here it is, like here's step one, two, three, four, here's a bunch of examples. So like, I, I hope people walk away like relieved <laughs> that they finally found like another example of someone, of a model, of some people they can study, of some steps they can study. I talk a lot about negotiating, about finding deals, all the nuts and bolts of the business that everything I've learned about you know, negotiating, buying, financing. I, I talk a lot about financing because that's such a key component. Mm -hmm. Talk a lot about management and the nuts and bolts of systems and checklists. Um, those things are fun and they're necessary, but you can do it. Like it's, it's not, this isn't a rocket science kind of thing. And it, it's, it's going to take some discipline. It's going to take some hustle, but you, you can do it. Yeah. So let's flip the script to the other side. You're now on Bigger Pockets uh, bookshelf or wherever you bigger because this is a Bigger Pockets book. Yes. You're on Amazon. You're looking for real estate books. Who's your avatar? Who should who should say? You know what? That's that's the next book I should read. I should I should pick the small and mighty real estate investor. Yeah, I think there's a there's a range, but I think my the person I wrote to, and I, I thought about this person the whole time, and it is somebody who's already got a property or two. And maybe usually those an accidental thing, like, oh, I moved out of my house and I rented my house or, you know, and they're like, oh, I'm in the real estate business, but oops, like, I don't really know how to do this thing. Um, and they're, they're sort of grasping for a business model, for a strategy. Like that's, that, that's my ideal customer. I wrote it for them because you, you, you could still be a brand new beginner and read this book, but I, I do get it a little bit more advanced that particularly the final chapters, I talk about making that transition from being a wealth builder, which there's a ton of ideas out there about how do you build wealth? How do you grow your wealth? And that's in there as well. But I, I see a lot less about how do you finish the race? Like, how do you yes. actually take that wealth and live off of it? Like, I don't see anybody doing that. I don't, you're, you're one of the few exceptions. Like you have enough income and you can, you've built your, your, your portfolio, but like, how do you actually transition to that point where you build a portfolio, you're confident. And I've been doing this yeah. for years. Like this, it was a struggle at first because like, the cash flow goes up and down. It's like a roller coaster. And so there's just a different sentiment that people who actually want to achieve financial freedom with their rental properties, like how do you make that push? And I, I spend a lot of time on the book making that case, which is if you're a beginner, it's kind of nice to know how you're going to finish the race, or at least here's some options so that you can see where, what your path is. So you're like, you, you're going to spend most of your time on the nuts and bolts, buying the properties, mm -hmm. financing, but it's nice to know there's an end here that you can be satisfied with that is reasonable and that you can, you can accomplish. Oh, absolutely. I think there's a lot in this. I think, you know, lots of folks on the one rental at a time channel are your avatar. Uh, I do think I have, again, read the book, we've gone through it. Uh, thank you for the early read. Um, I think there's a lot there. I think there's a, I, I, I love the relief at the end. I, I do think a lot of people, because again, I think the, the mantra bigger is better kind of making people feel almost inadequate is certainly out there. I fight against it every day. I'm glad I have you as a team member doing that. Uh, how can people follow you? Where, where should we send them? Well, I'm on YouTube as well. And I'm on, I have a podcast. That's where I spend my, my weekly, every week I have a new episode and you were one of my, my guests that was very popular recently. So thank you for that. But if you look, if you look up, uh, coach Carson, the, the podcast is called real estate Investing with coach Carson. If you look that up on YouTube, Apple podcast, Spotify, I'm out there all, all the time. I, I have, I, I haven't figured out how I could do such a prolific schedule. Like you have Michael, you, you do, you do some amazing work. Uh, but I, I do, I do once a week, uh, my podcast. And as I, now that I'm back in my just two weeks or a week and a half now back in my home in South Carolina, I'm going to start getting back into some of my tutorial videos. I really like doing like whiteboarding and say, all right, here's, here's how you analyze a deal. Here's how you do things. Here's how you still buy a property when interest rates are higher and show the numbers. And um, so I'll, I'll be getting back into some tutorials and little shorter form kind of whiteboard videos as well. But that's, it's my, I, I just love sharing. I love teaching. This is my, my passion now is, is getting to have a lot of other people. Like I, I feel connected with your mission as well. How many other people can we bring yeah. along on this ride and have, have them own properties that produce freedom for them. And, you know, maybe their freedom, their freedom, their why isn't traveling like it is for my family. Maybe it's, you know, building a nonprofit in their community that's helping people. Maybe it's being a teacher, maybe it's being, you know, some other, just being a present parent or helping a, a loved one, a, a parent who's sick. Like there's so many things that matter. That's my mantra on my channel. It's like, do what matters. Like, let's start with that. And then let's do what build, matters. I do what matters. That. Yeah, let's 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 start with that and and say what matters to you. Like, what do you want to spend your time with? What do you want to spend your time doing? Who do you want to be when you grow up? And then we'll help you figure out the real estate model to work that backwards. That's that's fix that's figure outable. But you you first, I think we grow up and we kind of get uh, this squash a little bit when we get in school. We get in the corporate world. It's like no, no, you can't really imagine these kind of things anymore. You just need to stick to the grind, do your job. I, I want to help you like. 
imagine what you could be like you're you're more than yeah. this you have more potential you could do more you could be more do what matters and rent, rental properties are an amazing simple tool that you can that are accessible to us as the as the average investor as opposed to having to go through all the complicated stuff on wall street and and doing all that this is this is a great path i couldn't agree more folks check it out the small and mighty real estate investor, Chad Carson. Thank you for all you do, man. Keep it up. I love you having as a team member on this fight to help people Thank you. earn freedom. Thanks, Michael. Absolutely. We'll stay in touch. Thanks, Michael. Mm -hmm. You got it.